right, so um, welcome to today's event. I'm Joan Monk Hartley from Herefordshire Green Networks Building Sense Group. Um, we were an initiative that started in 2020 to bring together people, information and professional expertise to help uh, with the challenge of making homes comfortable year round in the face of high heating bills and cutting carbon emissions. Um, today, with the support from the Green Register, who are training providers to construction professionals to help build better, more sustainable buildings, um, we're delighted to be hosting sustainability consultant Julie Godfrey on behalf of the Future Ready Homes programme. Um, Future Ready Homes is running in Shropshire, Powys and Herefordshire. It's being delivered by March's Energy Agency and Seven Wire Energy Agencies with the support of group, uh, groups such as ourselves, HDN in Herefordshire, Lightfoot in Powys and Zero Carbon Shropshire in Shropshire. The main focus of the programme is to promote and support good practice energy retrofit of homes across the whole of the Marches area. Um, and we're doing this through a webinar series, which is why we're all here today, um, giving out retrofit advice um, and green doors, which is going to be taking place in October. And I will tell you a bit more about that later on. So finally, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Um, Julie is a chartered engineer. She works as an independent sustainability consultant and her current projects include building performance evaluation of new and retrofitted homes and um, building passports and overheating in existing homes and retrofits. She works as head of net zero policy for CBISE where she leads the work on climate action, including the net zero carbon building standard policy work and collaboration with other institutions for joint climate action. Um, so this is going to be a really interesting session. Um, hopefully you will all agree. And over to you, Julie. Thank you very much and hello to everyone. I will have a presentation on uh, hopefully giving you a lot of information about what you can do to your home, whether it's already um, you're finding it's already in overheating or whether you're planning works to the home and you want to make sure that it's comfortable afterwards. Please do put your questions in the chat and really if there's a burning question that means you're not going to follow anything uh, interrupt in the middle. I don't want you to waste all the slot but ideally questions in the chat. So um, first of all, the, the development of this tool, I have to thank a few people, but basically it was funded by government, uh, then base department as part of their project of decarbonization of their housing stock, the social housing stock, especially. Uh, so it's an output that is independent from that program. It's now available for free. And many people were involved. We had a steering group as well as lots of people who reviewed the tool are provided alternative models that we could test our tool against are provided their home as a case study. What it started as is in 2019, a new build version of the tool. So we started at the time preparing essentially a risk assessment tool and guidance, mostly for planning authorities, because we are seeing a lot of development of new build homes which we thought really didn't take account of context very well, uh, ended up with highly glazed homes in the wrong location with very bad openings. And we thought surely something simple can be provided. So we did this at the time and it was quite successful. A lot of local authorities use it. The London plan has it uh, in their requirements to use. But obviously we were conscious that it only captured a small proportion of the stock and we were very keen to work instead as a development on existing homes and retrofit. So the version I'm going to talk to you about today is valid for any existing homes, whether it's an old Victorian home or relatively recent. If it's already built, that's the best version to use. It's available for free. You can download it from the Good Homes Alliance website. And um, 
It's really aimed for non-specialists. So we kept the principles um, that we had back in 2019, where we didn't want something that required an expensive consultant or very time consuming, very specialized modeling. We want something that allows people to make the right decisions based on common sense. It does mean that there are some things it cannot do. It will never be exact, but hopefully it's enough to set you on the right track and potentially identify where actually you may need if you're in a complex situation to get a little bit more specialist support. But hopefully the tool allows you really to identify when you're completely fine or where there are very big things that are problematic that you could address without expensive specialist knowledge. What we really liked in the new build tool is, is that it really was very simple. It's um, stayed on one page. We didn't need a spreadsheet. But um, the reality is that the existing stock is much more complex, is much more varied. And as you probably know, if you are already involved in the retrofit projects, we tend to go very early on in the project into very detailed questions because there's not that much you can do to existing homes. So it's a little bit more detailed than a one page easy um, version, but still it's not a detailed tool. So it stays um, on two pages. We have it as an Excel version, but we've also laid it out so that actually you do not need to use Excel if you don't want to use Excel. You can print it, end up with two pages. You write your own scores, which I will take you through, and you tot up the numbers by hand. It's really not complex calculations. Associated with that, there is some guidance. We also have prompts to highlight high-risk areas or high-risk rooms. Um, and yeah, so just to um, make it clear, it is a risk assessment. It's not a detailed assessment. It basically allows you to check whether you're at low risk of overheating. So as long as you keep the key principles and you follow them throughout detailed design and construction, you're probably fine in terms of overheating risk. It also, on the other hand, identifies where you're probably at high risk of overheating, which means you may want to do some modeling and hire a modeler to do that, but more likely I would say there are some very obvious things you could do to reduce risk. And then there's a zone in the middle where in a way it's almost the hardest. This is where potentially there's no big risk factor, but it's an accumulation of little things that potentially you can address yourselves or you may need a bit of support to help you identify the best solutions for your home. Before we go into the detail of the tool and the guidance, a question we often get and a question that we had was, does retrofit increase overheating risk? And more generally, does energy efficiency increase overheating risk? And it's obviously a very important topic and it's one that we did do a literature review to inform our work. Unfortunately, I will say the literature is often badly worded about this and headlines are often badly worded. So you may come across sometimes news or reports that say that there was a low energy home development and the homes overheated and it's worded as if the two were necessarily linked. And there's an implication that because the homes were energy efficient, because they were designed to be low energy, then they overheat. But often there is no evidence or no analysis to actually identify whether it's the energy efficiency features that lead to the overheating. And when there is, when you do look at detailed case studies, you find that very often the reason why the homes overheat are because of much more fundamental problems than the level of insulation. So very, very often the most common cases and the predominant causes of overheating in homes is that you have large areas of glazing, which are not shaded. So they accumulate heat gains 
very often because of the design of the windows, for example, very large panes of glass, which are floor to ceiling, the, the, or because of safety concerns, the opening of these windows is restricted by design or through a restrictor, which means that you get a lot of solar gains through the glazing and you can't dissipate it. Very often they are flats and they are single aspect, which means you are not able, so they are all the openings, all the windows of the home are on the same side. So you can't get a nice draft and breeze through the home to get rid of the heat. And another very, very common situation which contributes to overheating risk is noise. So more and more, uh, we build in places that are quite noisy, uh, cities and homes get, end up very dense very, with a lot of traffic. And that means that even if the windows are not restricted by design, people in practice do not open the windows a lot because it's just too noisy. And especially at night where they have to choose between being exposed to too much noise or too much heat. So it's really important to understand that, that the overarching causes of overheating in homes are the accumulation of heat inside in the first place through solar gains mostly, as well as other things, but solar gains can be dominant. And then the inability to get rid of that heat through your windows or other openings. It's not the level of insulation, the primary cause. So this is the building physics and the common sense in a way. Then what we also had through literature review is a few references that confirm this, but especially a very important study, which luckily for us ended up being published around the same time we were doing that review. So it's quite a recent work. And it looked at overheating in a very useful way in that it looked at the dwelling and the household characteristics. So how is the home built, but also how many occupants there are and how they occupy the home, as well as temperature monitoring and what people gave us feedback about the comfort in the homes. And again, this is really important. And this is why if you've looked at the topic, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to find actual data on how many homes overheat, because if you just have temperature monitoring inside the home, if you don't know whether people are at home, a room may be very hot, but just because people are not inside at the moment, they're out for work, it's not a problem. When they come home, they open the window, the home cools down. So temperature on itself is not an indicator, and we all tolerate slightly different ranges of temperature anyway. Similarly, user feedback is really important, but um, some people are not necessarily that aware about how heat may affect them. So for example, in care homes or homes with the elderly, feedback on its own may not be sufficient to gauge whether the temperature is acceptable. So this study is very unique because it has these three aspects and also it's quite large. So they received over 2,500 responses from people. They monitored home, um, several hundreds of homes, and overall it covered really seven, th several thousand homes. So we're quite confident about the findings from that study. And what they found is that essentially they didn't find significant differences in how prevalent overheating was depending on the energy efficiency measures in the home. So more or less wool insulation, single or double glazing, how many energy efficiency measures there were, it didn't seem to have a significant impact on whether or not the home overheated. So this is really positive and this is really important. Um, in fact, in some cases, so with loft insulation, they could see less overheating if you had more insulation. So, um, it is, again, this is important to realize is that sometimes insulation will protect you, energy efficiency will protect you from overheating risk. There were some correlations with the EPC rating. 
But when the researchers analyzed that, they attributed this to the homes being flat. So we know that flats are much more at risk of overheating than homes for all sorts of reasons. So they tend to be smaller, they tend to be more densely occupied, gains accumulate in a smaller volume. There's also gains from surrounding dwellings. Sometimes it's got communal heating with hot pipes that run along corridors, etc. So flats we know are at a higher risk of overheating than houses. Obviously, this is a topic that the researchers recommend should continue to be looked at. But basically with this evidence from the housing stock, as well as the principles of building physics and what we know of case studies that overheat, we were quite confident about how to address energy efficiency and its impact on overheating risk. So in summary, how do energy efficiency measures uh, impact overheating risk and how worried should you be as you go into energy efficiency works on your home? Um, some measures will help. So for example, adding roof insulation, especially if it, it protects the roof from getting hot, that could help overheating risk. Some measures may exacerbate overheating risk, but they will not create it. So if you think about it, as long as your home is at a temperature that is acceptable, um, essentially your energy efficiency measures will not increase temperature. Where it becomes a problem is if your home is already overheating and hotter than the outside, and you have higher insulation levels, then there will be less heat leaving the house to the outside. So if your home is already overheating, it is quite possible that the insulation levels will exacerbate the risk, but they will not have created the risk of overheating. As I've said before, the main reason that will create the overheating risk is too much gains from the outside, especially solar gains through your glazing and no shading, and not enough ventilation so you can get rid of the heat to the outside. That's about insulation largely. To a smaller extent, you also have an impact from air tightness. And so that's the direct air exchange with the outside essentially, but really the effect of infiltration. So if your home becomes very airtight, there will be less air exchange with the outside, but compared to the air exchange that you get through a window, for example, really air tightness impact is very small, especially in the summer where you don't have strong driving winds, etc. So you should not have to worry that having a more airtight home will create an overheating risk. What you have to focus on is making sure that you have good ventilation throughout the year and in the summer for getting rid of the heat. And lastly, as you look into energy efficiency measures and the retrofit works in general, there are many opportunities that you can take to actually reduce overheating risk and improve other things in your home for your comfort, for your air quality and for energy efficiency. So for example, small contributors to heat gains inside as are your heating and hot water systems. You may have an uninsulated hot water cylinder. Not only is that not efficient in terms of keeping the cylinder warm, um, but so you will consume more energy, but also in the summer, it will keep contributing to heat gains inside the space. So this is an energy efficiency measure that you can take to not only reduce your energy consumption, but reduce your risk of overheating. You can also take uh, measures to improve your ventilation, whether it's purpose mechanical ventilation and good window openings. You can install solar gain protection, so external shading that may in some cases also help with your privacy if you want in winter, etc. So the tool and the guidance that we have produced really try to show you where the big risks and opportunity are 
not only for overheating risk mitigation, but also energy efficiency and comfort overall in your home. Right, so I'll give you uh, an overview of the tool finally. Um, the way it's presented is, as I've said, it's a spreadsheet that broadly speaking has three parts. So you get a score of, over, of overheating and that gives you an indication of your risk. You have some additional questions, which I'll go through. And then you have two pages. Uh, with, as I've said, you can print them if you want and do your calculations manually or just use the Excel spreadsheet. You can see on the left-hand side, it's colored sort of orange-reddish. So that's measures that contribute to your overheating risk. And on the right-hand side, greenish is measures that reduce overheating risk. So you add up your risk factor, add up the mitigation factor, do risk score minus mitigation. That gives you your overall score and you know where you are on the risk scale. This is the tool itself, so very, very simple. Um, and on the right-hand side here, what you have is we have a guidance um, document, which is just a few pages for each question in the tool. You have two, three, four pages of guidance, how to score these questions, examples of the type of situations we're talking about in the tool, and things you may want to look at. So very often you will find probably that your home doesn't quite fit in the box that we have in the tool. So we are providing guidance about how to approach these situations. It really is quite simple. So as I've said, on the left-hand side is the heat, it's the risk factor. So mostly around heat gains, solar gains, gains from the your regional climate and local climate. So for example, where are you in the UK, but also are you in a dense urban area or rural or somewhere in between? And is it even within say London, you may be in a very green planted area near a large body of water, near a park, near a river, or you may be in a part of the city that is actually not very far, but very densely occupied with no greenery that will have a small impact on your local temperatures. And then on the right hand side, you have your ventilation potential. So how good are your window openings? Are you Do you have windows on both sides of the home? So you can really create a draft. Do you have a lot of greenery, etc. So heat gains and capacity to dissipate heat. And then the smaller points, you will probably find in your retrofit works that these are the ones that you are most likely to be able to influence a lot of the large measures probably you can't do much about, except how large are your glazed areas, whether they are shaded and how well they open. Everything else is likely to be quite an accumulation of small measures that you can take to improve. The risk. Um, you'll get a score overall and an indication of um, how risky that score is. You can, if you want, score your home pre and post retrofit. You don't have to, obviously. You can um, just do one situation if you wish. You can also um, add your own notes just as a record, for example, to say, oh, I've scored this question like this because I assumed this about the insulation in my wall. Again, you do not have to. If it is your own home, personally, I would recommend that you score it pre-retrofit because it allows you to check whether the result seems to make sense. For example, if at the moment you do not have any problem in the home, do your scoring and hopefully the score will show you the same, that you are at low risk. If it's very different, then there may be something you need to tweak in the assumption. Maybe you've interpreted a question not quite in the same way that it should be, or there is something very um, odd in your house in relation to the tool that is not captured. And if that's really the case and you can't work out why it's very different, if the tool is saying everything is fine or everything is very problematic and it's completely different from your experience, 
and please let me know because we can always look into it together and see whether in the tool something needs to be changed or whether it's more about an interpretation of the questions. What you do get, so it is a simple tool, as I've said. Um, it does mean that it will never be perfect and it is a whole dwelling assessment. So it's roughly speaking the risk in the home. It's not room by room. You will not be told your bedroom is at risk of overheating, but the lounge is fine. It's on average in the dwelling. However, we do know that there are situations that are typically risky and across the same home, you can end up with quite different temperatures of quite a few degrees between two parts of the home. So typically north and south half of the home, if that's how your home is configured, Obviously, top floor, second and third floor will end up being quite a bit warmer very often than the ground floor. Or you may have, for example, parts of the house that are very shaded and a lot or have a lot of glazing, parts that don't. So you can score in an average way or in a worst case way if you want in the main tool. But then these questions allow you to check actually is there a part of the home that is really quite different? And that's often how we experience a home. And so many people will say, my home is generally fine. There's just that room that of sometimes gets uncomfortable. And these questions should allow you to capture, oh yes, it's quite likely that actually I'm on the right track, that I should probably pay more attention to that particular room. I've gone through that, sorry. I should have flipped these before. Um, I want to highlight one question in the tool that is probably the only techie one, where if you read it, you will think, what is that talking about? Uh, and it's about noise. Noise is very complicated. Even I wrote the tool and the guidance, and every time I read it, I think, oh, I need some time to bury myself into it. I'm not a noise consultant. We had advice from a noise consultant on how to approach it. If you happen to be a noise consultant or are very knowledgeable in this area, do um, look at the guidance, do score it as much as you can on that basis. But personally, um, I would advise if you are not just on these questions about noise and how noise impacts window opening, it's your own home. You know how much noise impacts your window opening. So I don't need a noise consultant to tell me that on the half of my home that is on the road, I hardly ever open the windows and I certainly didn't um, at night when my bedroom was on the roadside. That's it, you know how you experience your home. So score the questions accordingly in terms of your behavior and how often you open the windows. And that leads me to something very important, um, which is that you will see in a lot of the questions, actually, the answer is not only about the home, but the answer is about the occupants or how the occupants are likely to respond to a particular situation. So there are some questions about how often and for how long and how densely the home is occupied. But there's also questions about, for example, how much noise restricts window opening. And in some situations that are very quiet or very noisy, everybody is likely to respond the same. But in most situations, we all have different reactions, different sensitivities to noise. So score it according to what you think is best for your home. So if it's you that are going to stay uh, in the home, score it for you. Um, you will see that there are some questions, for example, such as fan, uh, the use of fans, how often um, shading is used, or um, the use of nighttime ventilation, leaving windows open at night. Again, there are some things that the design can do in order to help certain behaviors, but you will also have your personal preference. So 
explore it for yourself, but also talk to your family, make it clear um, what assumptions you have made. So do not always assume that people will behave perfectly and have a look at the assumptions. I've marked them all. There's quite a few questions that could be scored differently depending on how you think people will use the home. And <clears throat> that idea of testing the tool with different scores in different questions is really important. So it's a simple tool. Um, so it's never going to be perfect, but also overheating risk assessments are not an exact science. Um, so I really encourage people to test the tool under two or three scenarios. So you could, for example, do an optimistic scenario and one where, on the other hand, you're, you take a more pessimistic or risk-adverse score against a few of the questions, and that will probably be much more useful than just getting a single number. You will see once you've used the tool the first time, it might take half an hour or an hour max. But after that, it's very, very simple to change some of the answers. So you'll get a bit of a range depending on how you decide to approach some questions. It's also um, that question that picture illustrates the fact that some of the questions say, how are the windows? Is it single glazed or double glazed? Or is are the walls insulated? As we all know, this is very simplistic. In most homes, you will have quite a mix of situations. So you could say, right, I'm going to, at the moment, I'll have one score where I assume everything is very energy efficient and another one where I'll assume the worst energy efficiency and that gives you a bit of a range. It won't have a massive impact, but overall it will probably be much uh, very useful for your understanding of the overall risk. So test different options that will help you with re um, building resilience in your assessment. Very quickly, um, to give you some confidence that hopefully the tool is useful and it works, uh, how we developed it. So as I've said, we started with a new build one and we received quite a lot of feedback there. We did quite a lot of modeling at the time. We also did common sense checks you know, knowing that certain situations are at low risk, other situations are at very high risk. That gives us the risk range. Essentially, we did the literature review and we also have simple calculations in the sort of steady state box to test the impact of me one measure against another. For example, exactly how much risk points should, you at should we attribute to insulation as opposed to air tightness. This is based on simple calculations of the impact on internal temperature. Um, and we also tested the tool against what we call post-occupancy evaluations for actual case studies of homes uh, where we do know quite a lot about the internal temperature, occupant satisfaction, and the design. And we also tested it against other models None of the comparisons are perfect because everything looks at slightly different factors. So for example, models, typically they do not take account of site context, uh, but they do take account of very detailed design measures. Post-occupancy evaluation is very, very useful, but obviously sometimes you do not know exactly how people have behaved or some people may be more or less tolerant so you can't fully rely on any of the methods, which is again why overheating risk assessments are not quite an exact science and having a range is quite useful. Right, so I'll take you through a few examples that we have overall in the tool uh, and the guidance, you will find 10 worked examples, which cover very, different typologies. As you can see here, we have flats as well as homes. We have extensions. We have homes of different ages, some that have been very um, retrofitted very deeply, others not. 
And we also have typical situations, for example, the introduction of a highly glazed area or a top floor extension. So you should find across all of these an illustration of the most common situations, hopefully those in your home as well. Uh, in most cases, we knew the occupants. In some cases, we did not, or certainly not all of them in the case of flats. Um, but we've tested it. That allowed us to build the tool iteratively to check whether the results made sense. And you'd be glad to know that um, we didn't find uh, the tool doesn't always predict a very high risk. It doesn't always predict a low risk. We did get a good spread in the responses. You'll find not only the, the case studies themselves, but also a summary in the guidance of the type of features it covers. So for example, if you want to know, or oh, I have a glazed balcony, et cetera, there's this flat, I'm gonna see how they've scored it. Um, it's not so much this situation will always be risky, but how might you approach it in your scoring? I'll go through just um, three, I think, and then we'll move on to questions. So the first um, works example that you will see, so they are fully scored with explanations, but today I'll give you just a full overview, but you'll find all the information with the tool. So this is a Victorian terrace in London. It has solid brick walls, quite high ceilings. It's quite a nicely sized, house and it has an attic conversion that was done a few years ago. It has a family of four people and three bedrooms plus a home office with quite large rooms. Quite a, so a good volume for the number of people that is there. It's the one that you can see here with the attic conversion. On this, that street is relatively quiet, but just behind is quite a major road. On the other hand, on the other side of the house, you have gardens and they look, they themselves look onto other gardens, mm -hmm. quite typical of a lot of urban houses, in fact, with two very different sides of the house in terms of exposure to noise and greenery. The score of that house, so the occupant that filled it in is very knowledgeable. It's my co-author, so she knew the tool quite well. And she ended up with a score of 31, which is just at the border between medium and high risk. And at the beginning, she said, well, that's a little bit high because my house generally is fine. But when we looked into it, the house generally in fire is fine, but she does have two areas that are uh, actually experiences, experiences quite high temperatures. So the kitchen, which is a back extension, quite highly glazed and not shaded, does get quite hot. And the attic bedroom can get quite hot, especially if they don't manage ventilation very well. So we thought, broadly speaking, in that case, having a sort of high medium risk is quite good because the house can perform well, but it does require attention. Otherwise, these two areas could become very uncomfortable. And for example, if you had people who do not pay attention to it and you put a child or an elderly person or someone whose health is not very good in this attic bedroom, that could become problematic to their comfort and maybe even their health. The rest of the house performs well. This house, uh, another one I know very well, it's my own house. So on the left hand side is um, how it was originally and on the right hand side is how it is now. So I built a loft extension and you'll see I also replaced um, the back windows in the, well, window past your doors. In the kitchen, again, Victorian terrace, but that's an end terrace, solid brick wall. Um, it's very different in that it's much smaller. Uh, I live alone, but the house is much smaller and it's quite noisy on the road side, quite, quite a busy road and obviously very different on the other side. It's only garden looking onto other gardens. Um, I, I scored it pre and post retrofit and you'll see a slightly higher risk 
um, but still very much in the medium or low medium risk, which is very much how I experience my house. It hardly ever gets too hot, even during heat waves. It really takes a good week of heat wave for some of the rooms to become hot. And even then it's only in the afternoons. As soon as um, the next day, basically I have very good nighttime ventilation. Um, and that really allows the house to cool down overnight and to remain cool for quite a few hours the following day. I was a bit worried that the top floor extension, so this one that you could see here, would get hot. Um, so it has a reasonable G value. It has approximately a third less glazing than my architect wanted. Um, it looks even, it looks like there's more glazing than there is actually, it's just from tabletop. Um, upwards and not even to the ceiling. So very much not what my architect wanted. Uh, and there's a green roof which protects the roof from getting too hot. Um, I want to highlight there are two features that I know work very well. And this is really important for you in how you plan your work. So uh, on the left hand side, you can see here. So these are the, from the inside, the doors in my kitchen onto the garden. And the left hand side is the old doors. They were very leaky, single glazed with a cat flap, et cetera. Very, very inefficient. So I changed them to much more efficient, fully glazed doors, as you can see. However, I knew that these high level openings worked very, very well. I knew that I used them. I knew that throughout the summer, I leave them open, especially at night, and that they were very effective as, at cooling down my house. So I insisted that they should be in the new design, even if again, my architect and the window people told me it's gonna be very, very expensive, et cetera. I knew they worked. And um, you know your house, if you've been living there for a few years, if there are things that work, trust yourself. <laughs> um, ultimately, there is. I was very happy to pay a little bit more for these additions if it means the house remains comfortable. And similarly, on the top floor, I have, as you can see, tilt and turn windows. So one that opens very widely and only, again, from the tabletop, not fully glazed, uh, not, sorry, from the bottom up. And the it also opens, as you can see, just from the top. So I use these smaller openings a lot during the summer overnight. And that's possible, obviously, because I'm on the quieter side. So <clears throat> one of the reasons why my post-retrofit risk score is not much higher than pre-retrofit one is all these design measures. So I paid attention to not having too much glazing, to being able to open the windows, etc. But another reason is that what the retrofit allowed me to do is that previously my bedroom was on the noisy side. So actually I could hardly ever open the window onto my bedroom to cool it down. While now I have more glazing in proportion than I did before, but I'm much more able to get rid of the heat in my bedroom. And last point for you, you'll probably have noticed that the windows open inwards. That is very deliberate. Uh, again, I had to insist with my architect because he told me I wouldn't be able to put crap on the windowsill. I don't care. <laughs> what it means is I can open the window and in the future, if I want, I can install external shading without, so for example, the drop down shutter and still leave the window open for ventilation. So do think about how your windows will open because unfortunately in the UK, many windows by default open to the outside and that does restrict the type of external shading that you can install. Um, finally, I think we still have a bit of time. So um, final example is um, my mother's flat. This is a 1950s flat in Paris. Uh, you can score for other countries. I wouldn't necessarily recommend scoring using the tool everywhere in the world, but if you're in Europe, I just adjusted a little bit the weather score um, since it's hotter in Paris, but apart from that, it's very similar. 
So 1950s flat, it's actually pretty highly glazed uh, when you look at the proportions, but the house is south and north facing and on the south, it has very deep balconies as well as overhang. So it works very well as shading protection in the summer and it is dual aspect. What I was very interested in with this flat is that actually it's very, it's technically dual aspect. So it has opening on both sides of the flat. However, if you looked at it on plan and you didn't know the home, you wouldn't necessarily assume that you, there is a good breeze because the, ha the flat is very deep and it's not quite one window straight away in front of another. There is a wall, a corridor, so the air path is very convoluted. And without knowing the flat, personally, I wouldn't have assumed that you could create a good breeze. However, having been there, I know that when you open the windows on both sides and wedge the doors open, actually the air does flow very well. Um, and again, the, the one of the reasons why we put that example is that that um, idea that I mentioned about being aware of all the points that do rely on occupant behavior. So this apartment, if you didn't know the occupant, you wouldn't know whether they're able to create a breeze, whether they actively try to create a breeze, wedging doors open, et cetera, it would score in the high-ish risk situation. While knowing the occupant, it's in the medium zone. And the reality is the, high, the flat does get warm sometimes now because Paris can be hot for weeks on end, that's uh, the temperatures are quite high in the summer. But uh, apart from that, it holds quite well, um, generally speaking. What, um, and I think it's even more comfortable than it looks here, and that's an issue of microclimate. So the flat is on a hill and it gets very, very strong breezes. This is again, something very, very site specific. The tool doesn't really cater for it, but I know overall that it means our score here is a bit conservative compared to the real situation. There will always be subtleties about your house or how you operate it or the very specific site that no simple tool will ever, ever be able to capture, but you should know um, have I scored on the safe side or have I been a bit too optimistic here? That's it. Hopefully it makes sense and we still have quite a bit of time for questions if you want. So I'll stop sharing now. Lovely. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, yes, we've had a few questions come in already, which I'm sure Tony is picking up now. Um, if anyone has any more, please, please add them in. Um, yeah, we're keen to see what those look like. Um, I have a feeling people are going to be after some real life, more real life examples, Julie. It was really, it was really interesting to see those at the end. Um, yeah, and I'm sure people are going to want to hear a bit more about that. So, Tony, over to you. Yes, indeed. Thank you for a, a very interesting presentation. I was going to say it, it's it's interesting to get to grips with those those case studies and see the real life examples. Um, so yes, not surprisingly, we're sort of getting questions about people with problems wanting solutions. Um, uh, so the first, uh, well, the first point from Anna is um, it's not always easy to open windows in urban areas on the ground or first floor because of security concerns, which is a fair point. Um, so Luke is asking, um, what can a leaseholder or a tenant do if they've got little control over the building? Um, if the landlord isn't happy to do things, presumably things like blinds, uh, they can put up. Oh, you're on mute, Julie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's two sides to your question. The, um, so this is exactly the sort of things where um, when we developed the version of the tool for existing homes, we took account of smaller measures, such as internal blinds, which are not 
as effective as what we would recommend in a new build, but we know that in some cases, the, these may be your only options. So internal blinds, you can take account of in our tool. You will see that it's not given a massive impact. Uh, you're quite likely to have to do other things if you're already experiencing overheating. Internal blinds will help. Um, but one issue that they can create, for example, is that they intervene with airflow. So um, pay attention a little bit to the type of blind that you have. I quite like the ones that have blades because obviously you can also use them for privacy, et cetera, but also potentially they let airflow. Uh, there's quite a lot of products now available and that should help you. In terms, uh, that's what you will look at. You'll be able to look at in the tool in terms of what you can do, you know, what you will be allowed to do that, you know, that will be very specific to the building owner, the leasehold situation, potentially your council. I don't know whether there is a question to this here, but one comment we often get is that local authorities prevent people from installing external shading. If that is the case, I would say insist because increasingly local authorities are starting to realize this is a problem and that if they never allow people to install external shading, they will have to allow people to install cooling, uh, which is certainly not a small visual impact in a home either. So, um, yeah, I think I will stop here and see what people want to get. Yeah, so you're... Um... So my question, I was just trying to sum things up. My question was, uh, does shading work best where it's external? Clearly you're saying that it is. So you yeah. prevent the solar gain from getting into the building in the first place. Yeah. Uh, John Cook uh, in Church Stratton has mentioned um, a good roof, roof, uh, roof overhang is important and it's really useful in that it helps shade south facing windows in the summer when the sun is high, but in the winter when the sun is lower, uh, the solar gain can still come in. Um, if, if you get the angle of the the exactly. um, the overhang right, um, okay. so another question uh, where where that's not an option and you can't. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of um, Velux uh, roof lights in, in the roof, um, mm -hmm. where where shutters or an awning uh, is not a possibility. Uh, what can you do that works best internally? One of the questions here is a solar film on the windows. Is that does that yeah. work? So, um, so actually, interestingly, in one of the case studies, you will see Velux and, uh, well, there's two case studies, one where they've installed an internal blind, and that's actually the first case studies that um, I mentioned today. Another one is much more modern, and they did find external roller blinds, um, so you can get them actually from Velux windows. Otherwise, as you've just said, solar films are also an option. The um, I would say solar films, in a way, are always your. I mean, external blind shutters, etc. In our world, of OVT consultant, they are perfect because um, they give you control. They allow you to let as much solar gain as you want during the winter. They allow you to use it or not use it for privacy reasons, etc they um, will need a little bit more attention and general maintenance, just as you would for other things in your house, like the gutter. Um, a solar film, sometimes the issue is that they can make the light um, inside your house a little bit too gloomy, so be careful not to overdo it. And obviously you will also reduce your solar gains in the winter if you do that, not just in the summer. Um, okay. Um, question from Luke, does the risk assessment, uh, the, the tool, I think he means, um, take into account the impact of surrounding buildings, mm -hmm. their proximity, given their shading or even solar reflection? That's starting to get a bit technical, I would think. Yeah, so uh, we don't take account of, say, solar reflections from neighboring. This would be extremely specific and I would say reasonably unusual. However, what you do take account of in the tool, generally speaking, is shading onto your glazed areas, 
whether that comes from a wall or in other buildings, it doesn't matter as long as it's close and high enough to shade your glazed area, you can take account of it. Okay. Um, okay, question from Heather. I see color is a mitigating factor in the tool. Um, that's something we wondered for a flat roof below a bedroom. Uh, the, so the bitumen on the flat roof, uh, it retains heat in the heat wave. If the roof isn't, isn't strong enough for a green roof or a living roof, which would be ideal, um, would a small layer of white pebbles assist or just paint? I, I think we know from um, countries in North Africa and the Middle East that, that white paint is a, a good way to go. Yeah, that's it. So it's, I mean, color is more, you know, whether it's dark, such as, as you say, dark bitumen, etc., or these, as you've just said as well, say North African or Greece, very reflective white paint uh, you can take account of. So this is where the tool becomes, in a way, quite cautious because it's never... And either or you have so many surrounding surfaces that having an exact answer and being able to quantify it is very difficult. Um, so sometimes some people say that we have been a little bit too cautious and we should attribute more benefits to this kind of measures. Uh, so you can take account of green roofs, you can take account of white white painted versus dark bitumen roofs uh, but it is quite cautious because um, ultimately the data sometimes is lacking a bit and we don't want people to you know just think everything would be fine because they've painted their roof um, but okay. you can take it. and you will see that in accumulation for example once we we tested the same whole house in the tool in a very dark area. Uh, so, you know, surrounded by dark surfaces, so dark brick, bitumen, et cetera, and no shade, no neighboring park, et cetera, versus one that would be the complete opposite. And in accumulation, you do get a substantial effect. Okay. It's just not one measure on it, so. Right, uh, so the tool allows you to try out so, uh, sort of ideas that you have, see see what the effect would be. Does it go so far as to provide suggestions? If you don't know, if you haven't got any ideas, does it mm -hmm. does it make suggestions for you? Well, what it does is that you can see all the options that you can score. So they are your suggestions okay. in effect. Right, and right, in okay. the guidance, you get a little bit more as well. But essentially, um, you just have for each question, you have a number of options. And that determines your points. So they are your suggestions. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of comments I'm just going to read out to share. Uh, I have found that our thermal blinds installed in a south facing bay window in a room that would overheat have been incredibly effective um, at reducing the temperature. So that's cool. Um, we've also got a thumbs up for an external roller blind I've just installed. They can only be described as witchcraft. They are amazing. You feel the temperature drop as you close them. Um, and my daughter then, of course, switches the light on. Yes, I feel your pain. Um, uh, shading can also be provided by trees in summer. Yeah. Um, of course. Um, I'm, I want to ask you a, a particular question, if I may, Julie, because um, so uh, the house I'm in at the moment is, is a Victorian terrace, like uh, the case studies that you brought up. And uh, th so the loft is converted. The north side doesn't get too hot. But the south side, so the south side has a couple of velluxes, so we keep the, the shades drawn so the solar gain doesn't come through the velluxes too much. But the sloping ceiling insulation is really poor. So we've got you know, black slates, dark gray slates soaking up the heat. Uh, there's a thin, well, there's a, there's a bit of a cavity. There's a thin amount of fiberglass and then plasterboard. So the heat is, as far as I'm concerned, is just soaking through the roof. It gets very warm. Um, and obviously on a still, evening you open the velluxes and there's no breeze to get the heat out um so um I, I just wanted to focus on insulation briefly rather than the, all the shading uh you know if we if we put lots of uh, kingspan in between the rafters or if we put wood fiber insulation mm -hmm. to, to retain heat in the winter is that also going to be effective at deflecting 
the heat in the summer? Yes, so you will see this is one of the examples where at the start I was saying you will find some energy efficiency measures actually help reduce your overheating risk. And what you've described is the textbook example. So in that large study of several thousand dwellings, this is the one example. So loft insulation, if you do not have enough of it, typically it will contribute to overheating risk and the tool can guide you towards that as well. Yeah. Okay, um, but but with the sloping ceiling, where there's, you know, you've got limited thickness to play with. I wonder if I can push. Is, is there a product that is more effective? Would you go with a a silver foil PIR sort of board rather than wood fiber? Or so we don't go. We don't go into that level of detail in the tool um, and. How you select your insulation will depend on a lot of things. So, for example, if generally speaking, depending on the type of construction, if generally speaking, the approach in your house is more traditional construction where moisture flows through the fabric, I wouldn't, in one location, introduce a completely impermeable approach. Oh. So it depends a little bit on your home as a whole. If it's a new build, then it's completely different. And it may be that this type of insulation is fine. But for example, in mine, which is traditional Victorian, um, sort of moisture permeable throughout, and I had more space, I did use wood fiber and then a layer of lime plaster. So it depends a little bit on the overall approach in your house. Sure. Um, okay. Um, if there are no further questions, I think we've got one more comment from Anna saying, um, I'm familiar with external blinds uh, in Germany. I've never come across them in the UK. I've asked shops about them, which specialize in selling blinds. They don't even know what I'm talking about. Perhaps um, that can be a little bit of homework for MEA or HTM. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can um, make some suggestions as to where they might be located. Um, You're starting Jim to find them. You're, you're starting to find them. I agree that it's a bit frustrating in that many clearly do only have a sort of shop windows in mind when you go to them, they are very expensive, but it's, the, it's much more available now than it was even a year ago. And to some extent it's because of heat waves to another is because now building regulations for new build homes pay much more attention to overheating. So certainly because of the increased requirements on new build, more and more products are becoming available. Uh, so keep looking. Uh, there are many more than there were before. Okay, so I was gonna suggest we'll we'll do some digging and we'll see what we can come up with when we send out the um, the uh, recording um, yeah. and further uh, publicity for Green Doors, which no doubt we'll be doing. Uh, we will let you know. Uh, so thanks, Julie. I'm going to hand back to Jem. Lovely. Yes, thank you very much, Julie. Um, really, really useful. And everyone, we will share um, the links again to the tools so that you can start going on and having a look. I know some of you were jump straight on it um, while we were on this this webinar. So yeah, we'll, we'll circulate that with you so you can start having a play around. Um, and actually, it'd be interesting to know how you find out. If you want to share some of your results um, back with me at HDN. Um, yeah, I'd be really keen to find find um, what your results are looking like. Um, right, so what else have we got coming up next? Um, next webinar is next week, um, the 25th of October. Totally different subject. We're going from keeping uh, cool to warming up again um, with some low and no cost retrofit measures. Um, yeah, so we might well have a bit of overlap coming along, actually, especially when we started talking about thermally lined curtains and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, come along to that one next week, earlier start time of 12 p.m. rather than 1. So just be aware of that and please invite others to come along, too. Um, before that, you can come and talk to us in person if you'd like to. Um, we do have legs. We're not just faces. Um, so we will be in Bishop's Castle at the Environment Fair this Saturday. Um, you will see Tony there and I am going to be in Crown Hope in Herefordshire um, at an Environment Day there as well. So if you are local and would like to, please come and say hello. Um, we don't bite. We've all
also got um, other webinars coming up, um, more case studies. We know you love to see real homes um, and what people have done to their properties. So at the moment, we're looking um, at putting on a Manchester-based one, not our usual area, but it's um, 1960s, I believe, um, fairly deep retrofit retrofit of a fairly modern construction home so that will be an interesting one um and then we've got one of a solid stone property as well um we always get lots of interest in people who have solid solid stone properties and what they can do with them so keep an eye out for those jem may i just um interrupt you for five seconds I, as everyone will have picked up uh, jem means uh the 23rd of september and the, yeah, 25th and the 25th of september, of september <laughs> um so <laughs> Monday, um, so yeah, so this Saturday, uh, we're out and about at the fairs and uh, a week today on Monday uh, is the next webinar. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I just lost a month. That's good. I feel better now. I've got more time. Um, yes, and then it, actually in October, we have Green Doors. Um, so for those of you who don't know um, what Green Doors is, it's it's where people who have retrofitted their homes in some way, where they've added in green tech with solar and batteries and SLC pumps, and or they've taken fabric first approach um, and significantly upped their insulation, their loft, their internal walls, external walls, et cetera. Um, they open their doors so that you can go and have a look and you can talk to them, you can find out what it's actually like to go through a retrofit project what you have to think about, what it's like living with those air sorts of heat pumps, what different insulation options you've got. Um, and you're talking to people that have been there and done it before and learning from their experiences. It's always really popular. Um, it's growing every year. It's all across Herefordshire, Shropshire and Powys. Um, it's on the Future Ready Homes website. So go and have a look. I will send you details of it. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's a nice, a nice event to get out and enjoy and it's across three weekends um this year as well so you've got plenty of opportunity to go out and see homes um and see more than one if you'd like to um so keep an eye out and if you've got a home yourself that you've um retrofitted and you'd like to join in open your doors um we want as many as possible open and um, so yeah if you've got your own or you know of anyone else that might want to take part just for a day for an hour even um we'd love to have them involved um, and then we've always got Ask an Expert still. So um, Future Ready Homes has a tech panel um, of a whole heap of people with a whole range of experience when it comes to retrofit. Um, we are putting information up on the web on our website all the time, frequently asked questions, resources, um, et cetera, when it comes to retrofit. But if there's something missing, if you've got a, a, a question that you really want to ask um, and it would help you with, making decisions or putting some plans in place for your retrofit let us know um, and we would love to be able to help you answering those questions it's entirely free of charge um, and yeah we publish them for the benefit of others as well so that we can all learn um, from our shared experiences so that's about it thank you ever so much julie thank you once again um green register thank you for your support as well in putting this on um, and yes, we will see you next week, not in October. We'll see you well before then um, for the next webinar. And hopefully we'll see some of your faces as well in person. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks all. <laughs> Bye.